Today, we're gonna to talk about the three pillars of exposure, shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, and how they can be used to take your videos and photos to their highest potential. They really shouldn't be difficult to use, and I'm hoping by the end of this video, you have a better grasp on how to use all three when you're out in the field. The cost of admission will be one like and one subscribe. If you've already subscribed, then you're gonna to have to hit that notification bell in order to continue. That will give you lifetime access to all this content. So the first part of this video will just be a general overview for those of you who just need a refresher, and then we'll take a deeper dive into shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. We'll explain how each one works, about basing out our camera, the exposure triangle, the 180 degree shutter rule, the focal length shutter rule, exposure tools such as the exposure compensation meter, histograms and zebras, exposure adjustment, ND filters and polarizers, stops of light, shutter priority, and aperture priority. And do some real world scenarios so that we can put everything that we learned to the ultimate test. Instead of making 18 small videos on each one of these topics, I figured I would just throw it all into one video so you would have a one-stop shop to come and check it out whenever you have a question about it. I'll make sure to leave all of these topics as timestamps inside of the description so you'll have easy access to them. Make sure to take notes because there's gonna be a 25 question multiple choice test at the end of this video that you must receive an 80% or higher. I will leave that in the description. I'll be using the Sony ZV-1 and the A7 III for all of these tests, but you can really use any camera you have because all of the principles are the same when it comes to exposure. Also pay attention to the exposure bar because I wanna show you the exact camera settings I had set for exposure inside the camera for every single one of the photos and videos that I post here. It's really important to coincide what a video and picture looks like compared to the exposure settings that are inside of the camera. The art of a filmmaker or photographer is really the art of capturing light. Exposure is the overall brightness or darkness of a photograph or video, and it really comes down to the amount of light that reaches your camera sensor. How one allows that light to hit your camera sensor using the exposure tools is the duty of the operator, AKA you and me. I feel like most people, including myself, just dabble with the exposure settings as we learn filmmaking and photography, and we just kind of stumble along as we go. But I figured I would make this comprehensive video so we could finally put this behind us and really understand it. So why not just set our cameras to auto exposure and let the camera do the work? Well, we really wanna be in control of what the camera is exposing for. And we wanna know the limitations of our exposure settings before we start to shoot. For example, how low can I take the shutter speed before you really start to see some of that unrealistic motion blur? Or how high can I take the ISO before you start to see the image fall apart? This clip was shot in auto exposure, and because the camera set the shutter speed higher, it produced light flickering in the footage due to the fluorescent lights in the ceiling. You really can't recover this in post, so it's safe to say that I shuttered myself into a corner. Had I gone out and shot in manual exposure, I would have known to keep the shutter speed lower, so I wouldn't have seen that flickering from those lights. Let's talk about what each exposure setting controls and why they're so important to understand. I'm gonna share with you some real world scenarios where I wasn't in complete control of my exposure and show you some of the problem footage that I came home to after the shoot. Shutter speed is used to show motion or freeze motion in your video or photo. The lower the shutter speed, the brighter your image. The higher your shutter speed, the dimmer your image. When shooting video, if you set your shutter speed too low, you're gonna end up with stuttery footage, like this footage that happened to me during an interview due to poor lighting conditions. This is why it's so important to always have a B cam or a second camera in case your first camera fails or you just fail yourself. That was me setting the shutter speed too low. If you set your shutter speed too high, it can create a weird jittery effect seen in this video. We will talk about the specifics of these settings later in the video. When it comes to photography, if you set the shutter speed too high, you won't get any realistic motion blur. Like if you're shooting a car that's driving by and your shutter speed is too high, it will look like the car is just standing still, which might be a good thing if you're into shooting like action sports or insects flying. But for the most part, you wanna be in control of your shutter speed. Whereas if you set your shutter speed too low and you're hand holding the camera, your image may come out shaky looking on things that are not even moving like we learned in the last video. Why is it coming out blurry? Aperture controls the depth of field. Aperture is also known as f-stop. The lower the aperture, the more of a blur you get in the background. The higher the aperture, the more clear your background. Watch the background go from clear due to a higher f-stop or higher aperture number to a blurry background using a lower f-stop or a lower aperture number. 
This is important because if you're trying to shoot two different subjects at different ranges in front of the camera lens and your aperture is set too low, one subject will be in focus and the other one would be out of focus. That's why for this shot, I used a high aperture because I wanted to get both of the soccer players in focus. Knowing what aperture you should be at before you even pull out your camera is a really good practice. That's why I always try to figure out my aperture before I even step on set. I'll even do it when I'm sitting in my car at a stoplight. I'll just look around and try to figure out what aperture I would be at if I was about to shoot that scene. As a rule of thumb, a comfortable aperture to be at when you're trying to shoot two different subjects at two different ranges in front of the camera is somewhere around f5.6 and f8. When it comes to ISO, if you're in a low light setting and you crank up the ISO, you're gonna make your image brighter, but it's gonna introduce graininess and noise into the image, and it quickly diminishes the quality and crispness of the video or photo. Every camera is different, and it's your responsibility to figure out how high you can crank the ISO before the image starts to fall apart on your particular camera. The first thing that I would do if I were me is I would actually find out where the image starts to fall apart on my camera, and then I would make sure the auto exposure is set to that number as a maximum. That way I know my camera won't be taking photos or videos that will just be trashed by the time I get to post. It is always important to play back your photos and videos while you're on set so you can have a good gauge of how your photos and videos are coming out. But sometimes the little displays on our cameras aren't big enough and we can't see those imperfections until we get inside on our big computers. I can tell you that I've been there where I got home after a shoot thinking that everything was exposed perfectly and then once I put it onto my computer, I realized that a lot of it was not. But that's okay, I've learned and now I wanna teach you so that you don't make the same mistakes. So that's why it's important for you to know your exposure settings and know your surrounding environment. It's also why we really shouldn't be using auto exposure unless there is no other choice. I will be using auto ISO on some of these test shots just to make sure we are always properly exposed, but it's just for testing purposes only. Now to get more specific on what each one of these exposure settings are, we have to understand how they work. Shutter speed is based off of a second of time. So if I'm shooting with my shutter speed set to one over 50, that means my shutter door is opened for 1 50th of a second. To see how fast of a shutter speed one over 50 is, I removed the lens on the camera so that we could actually see in real time how fast 1 50th of a second is. If I set the shutter speed to one, then the shutter door will be open for one second, so it looks like this. Remember that the higher number in shutter speed you go, the dimmer the image. The lower number in shutter speed you go, the brighter your image. To make it a little bit easier, I came up with a poem. Think about a door to a store only open for a period of short. Kind of like a store on Black Friday. Sometimes the stores will only open the door for a short period of time because they don't wanna have over capacity. So at a certain point in time, they'll close it and that's the amount of people that are in the store. Same with shutter speed. The amount of time the door is open, allowing light in to hit the camera sensor. Aperture or f-stop is how wide the opening in the lens is. The wider the hole gets, the blurrier the background. The more closed up the hole, the clearer the background. Aperture is measured in f-stops. The lower the number of the f-stop, the wider the hole. The higher number of the f-stop, the smaller the hole. For example, this is an aperture of f2.8 and this is an aperture of f11. You can think about this like the door analogy we had for shutter speed. How big is the door that's letting in all of those people or in this case, how big is the hole that's letting in all that light? Also, the higher number your aperture, the darker your image. The lower number your aperture, the brighter your image. Aperture has the same principles when it comes to photography and filmmaking. And same with ISO. ISO is your camera's sensitivity to light. The lower the sensitivity or the lower the ISO, the better quality video or photo you have. The higher the sensitivity or the higher the ISO, the less quality of an image you'll have. You can think about this like someone who's in distress. The more stressed out someone is, the worse quality decision they will make. Whereas the more calm, cool, and collected someone is, the better quality decision they'll make. When a camera sensor is at its lowest sensitivity, AKA base ISO, it can produce the cleanest and highest quality photo and video. We don't wanna stress our cameras out by setting the ISO too high. We're really not stressing out our camera, but that's just an analogy for you to better understand. I didn't make a poem for aperture, but I did make one for ISO, which is keep your ISO as low as you can go. Most of the cameras ISOs that I've shot with start in the 100 range and then they go up from there. Sometimes when you use picture profiles, your ISO will jump up to 800 or 1000, but that's something we covered in the picture profile video and we're not even gonna touch on it here. If you missed that lesson, then you can watch it after this video, but you will receive a late grade. 
This would be a good time to start talking about basing out our camera. It's always best to start your camera at its base settings and then adjust it out from there. Having your camera based out will ensure that your camera is set to optimal performance. To base out your camera for video, we first need to figure out what frame rate you will be shooting in. For interviews and talking head type shots, I shoot in 24 frames per second. This provides the most realistic look with just enough motion blur to make it look natural and cinematic. For something that I might slow down later in post, like some B-roll or landscape shots, I'll shoot that in 60 frames per second. For something that I'm definitely gonna slow down, I'll shoot that in 120 frames per second. Either way, once you know your frame rate, you can set your shutter speed, and we wanna use the 180 degree shutter rule for filmmakers and the lens focal length rule for photographers. For filmmakers, the 180 degree shutter rule states that your shutter speed should be double your frame rate. So if you shoot in 24 frames per second, you just double that, which is 48. And most cameras don't have a shutter speed of one over 48, so you will just change your shutter speed to one over 50. If I'm shooting in 60 frames per second, I'll change my shutter speed to one over 20. If you stick to this rule, you should be fine, but these rules can be broken. I've done it a lot, but just don't stray too far from that so you don't have any weird footage to come home to. I find that when I'm shooting 24 frames per second, I can take the shutter down to like one over 25 before I really start to see that stuttery effect. It's good to know how low you can take your shutter speed before you start to see that stutter because you might be shooting in an office building where they have those fluorescent lights and if you do shoot at one over 50 and you're shooting 24 frames per second, you'll still see that flicker. So whenever I go into an office, if I'm shooting in 24 frames per second, I'll just take my shutter speed down to one over 25 and then I'll just watch the footage back, make sure it looks good and then just continue to shoot and I never have any issues with that flickering light from inside offices and hospitals. When it comes to photography, like we learned on the last video, your shutter speed should match or exceed the focal length of your lens. So if I'm shooting on like a 50 millimeter lens, I'll make sure that my shutter speed is at one over 50 or above. If you're on a tripod, it won't really matter, but these are for the times that you're actually hand holding the camera. So now that we have our frame rate and our shutter speed set, we turn to aperture. And the first question we have to ask ourselves is, what are we shooting? A product video where we would like the product to stand out, or a portrait where we wanna create that depth of field between the background and our subject, a landscape shot where we would like to have pretty much everything in focus, a shot where two subjects might be in various locations in front of the lens and we need to ensure both of them are in focus. Once we figure that out, we can start to set our aperture. As a rule of thumb, you'll wanna use a lower aperture for product photography and portraits and a higher aperture for landscape photography and time-lapse videos and somewhere in the middle for street photography and B-roll. Don't forget that the higher number your aperture, the darker your image goes, so keep that in mind. So now we have our frame rate, shutter speed, and aperture set. Now we're gonna turn to the ISO, and we're just gonna keep it as low as it can go, in this case, 100. Okay, so now that our camera is completely based out, we're gonna look at it on an exposure triangle and talk about the symmetry between the three exposure settings. You can Google an exposure triangle and you can find many different variations, but I just created this one because all of the ones that I found seem to be out of date. I'll leave a link to this one in the description so you can download it and keep it on you while you're on set if you want. On the left side, we have apertures starting from the top moving down. We can see the aperture is all the way up to F22. This is equivalent to no blurry background. That's why you can see the nice clear background behind the goat. As we move down, we can see the background becomes blurrier as the aperture opens up and the image gets brighter because more light is being let in. Then we cross the bottom and we see the ISO. As we turn the ISO up, the image becomes brighter, but the higher you go, the more grain is introduced. That's why when you're shooting in low light, there's a temptation to just turn that ISO up, just be weary and know your ISO limits. We continue to the shutter speed, which is going up from a really fast shutter speed to a really slow shutter speed, as the shutter speed is lowered, more light is let in, which produces a brighter image as well as more motion blur. If we use the exposure triangle, it gives us better insight on how three of these different exposure settings work together depending on what you're shooting. This is what it looks like when I'm shooting an insect flying. Here's what it looks like if I'm shooting a portrait shot. And this is what it looks like if I were to shoot a landscape shot. In video, it would look like this if I were shooting a clip at 24 frames per second interview style shot with controlled lighting. This is what it would look like if I was outside in the morning and I was shooting some B-roll at 60 frames per second. And this is what it would look like if I was shooting in 120 frames per second. If you haven't been to dim.fi and messed around with their little interactive exposure triangle, I highly recommend you go over there and just play with it for a while until you start to get a grasp between the symmetry of these three exposure settings. 
I'll leave a link in the description to their website so you guys can go check them out. Now that we have our camera exposure settings completely based out, most likely you're gonna go outside and see that your camera is completely overexposed due to the uncontrolled lighting environment if it's during the day or completely underexposed if you go inside during the evening. Before we get into how to fix this problem, let's talk about how to know if your camera is properly exposed, looking at a few of the different meters within the camera. You can tell when a video or photo is way overexposed just by looking at the display on the camera, but it's almost impossible to see if it's a little overexposed just enough to tick you off when you get to the editing room. Just like pilots don't rely on looking out the window when they're flying, they have a whole dashboard of instruments. We too also have a couple of instruments that we can use to see if we are overexposed or not, and we don't have to rely on just looking at the display. The way we can tell if a video is overexposed without having to rely on the display is by using zebras, histograms, and the exposure compensation meter. There are other more sophisticated tools, but these are the basic ones and the most used tools in photography and videography, so that's what we're gonna use. You can use all of these meters or just one of these meters. I personally use the exposure compensation meter the most, but if I'm in a bad lighting environment and I wanna get precise readings, I'll use the zebras and the histogram. The exposure compensation meter is a meter that can be used as a monitor to see how your camera is currently exposed. If it's not at 0.0, .0 then you're either underexposed or overexposed. Anything in the negative will be underexposed and anything over will be overexposed. You wouldn't want the exposure compensation meter to be a judge because I've gotten home from shoots where I left my camera at 0.0, .0 the entire time and the exposure compensation meter just wasn't telling the truth. Some of my images were just not properly exposed. It should just be used as a reference, but it's a good starting point and most of the time pretty accurate. When it comes to picture profiles, sometimes it's better to be overexposed so you have more room to grade in post-production. But for the most part, we're gonna keep it at or below 0.0. .0. Notice how I said at or below, because it's very difficult to recover overexposed images compared to underexposed images. It would be better to keep your camera underexposed at negative 0.3 or negative 0.7 compared to overexposed at 0.3. Now let's talk about the histogram. Every modern camera has one, and sometimes I'll just leave the histogram up on the display as I shoot throughout the day, especially in bad lighting environments. A histogram shows you the graphical representation of the tonal values of your image. It goes from 0% being black to 100% being white. The darkest tones are shown on the left of the histogram, and as you move towards the right, the tones get lighter. The middle of the histogram are where the midtones lie. The taller the peaks in the histogram, the brighter the tonal values are in the image. This image is underexposed with the darks peaking. This happens a lot in low light settings or shooting at night. This image is overexposed with the whites peaking. This happens a lot when you shoot by a window or you're outside with the skies in the background when you're exposing for something in the foreground. When you shoot with the camera that has a higher dynamic range, the less of a threshold your camera is to peaking. That's why bigger sensors are a big deal. This is a perfectly exposed image where we see no peaking and no roll off before the wave reaches the extreme sides. I love when I see a majority of the peaks a little to the left of the middle of the histogram. We can use zebras or the zebra pattern to see which tones are overexposed. The zebras overlay stripes into the image which indicates what is being overexposed. Because every camera has different dynamic range capabilities, zebra settings will range from camera to camera. I like to set my zebras maybe around 95% and then I just adjust my settings until the zebras disappear. When it comes to skin tones, I find that 65% is generally a good area to work with. So I just point my camera at the subject. If I see any zebras, I'll just turn the shutter speed up until the zebras disappear. This way I know I'm properly exposed. Now that we know how to better understand if our image is properly exposed, we can talk about what we need to do in order to get our image properly exposed. So we base out our camera with a frame rate of 24 frames per second. We set the shutter speed to one over 50, the aperture to f2.8, and we just left the ISO as low as it can go, in this case, 100. Now, if our image is underexposed, we can always introduce more light like this one, a camera light that goes on top of the camera. This one's made by Ulanzi. I'll leave it in the description. Or we can set up an external lighting system, whether that's a professional light kit or put our subject by a window if it's during the daytime. 
If introducing more light to our image is not an option, then we can always turn up our ISO. Just be careful you don't go too high. And that's where setting the limitation on your auto ISO is so important. Now, I don't wanna be overly cautious when it comes to raising our ISO. I just want you to be aware of the risk that is involved when you do so. The image starts to fall apart on the ZV-1 at around ISO 1600, whereas the ISO can be taken all the way up to 6400 with the a7 III. Just know your limitations on whatever camera it is that you're using. Now, if our camera is based out and we go outside on a cloudless day, or we just go to a really bright area, we're gonna see that our image is completely overexposed and that's when we introduce ND filters to our lens. I picked this one up from Amazon. I'll leave it in the description. It's super helpful and it's a really good ND filter for everything that I've used it for. An ND filter is like sunglasses for your camera without changing the color of light. It prevents us from having to crank up our shutter speed or our aperture in order to dim the image. Sometimes there's a temptation to just crank up your shutter speed so that you can dim the image, but then you're gonna lose out on all that motion blur or you just wanna crank up your aperture to dim the image, but now you've lost out on that nice blurry background that you were hoping to get for that portrait. Not to mention, if we do crank up the shutter speed for video, we're gonna end up with jittery looking footage and it's just not gonna turn out right. And with photography, a lot of times you wanna have some of that motion blur, so you don't wanna have to crank up your shutter speed. That's why ND filters are so important. So instead of cranking up the shutter speed or the aperture, we just put an ND filter on it so we don't compromise our composition. Remember that a lower aperture means a bigger hole, which means more light will enter into the sensor, which means the brighter your image, which means, I'm just kidding, I just wanted to say which means again. It's hard to get a lower aperture or more of a blurry background when you're outside shooting during the day without touching the shutter speed. So in this case, I would just attach the ND filter and be able to maintain the aperture that I need. ND filters are measured in stops of light. A stop of light when it comes to ISO is measured just by doubling the ISO. So one stop of light from a base ISO at 100 would just be 200. And then the next stop would be 400. The same thing with shutter speed, except it's the opposite. When you go from one over 125 to one over 60, you are actually adding one stop of light. If you were going from 160 to one over 125, then you would actually be having one stop of light. When it comes to aperture, stops of light are measured a little differently and it's just something you'll have to commit to memory. F-stops move up in full stop increments. If you add one stop of light to F2.8, it equals F4.0. If you add another stop of light, that's F5.6, etc. ND filters come in fixed sets of stops of light like these filters, or you can just purchase a variable ND filter that allows you to adjust it by twisting the amount of stop you want to remove. This way you don't have to constantly be taking on and off your ND filters. I say go with the variable ND filter. Just be aware that there's a little bit of vignetting that happens up in the corners if you crank it too much. Another thing ND filters can be used for is long exposure photography. You need to be able to take your shutter speed down pretty low, like 15 to 30 seconds, and that means a lot of light has the potential of coming in. You need to be able to take your shutter speed down pretty low, like 15 to 30 seconds, which means a lot of light has the potential to come in. Without the ND filter on, you're just gonna have to wait till it's really low light out, or a little low light, or a lot of low light. A little low light, a lot of light. Well, you can't talk about ND filters without talking about polarizing filters. ND filters and polarizers work differently. Polarizers block light reflected off of a surface like water, and it can enhance the color of an image. Polarizers can bring out some really beautiful and lush colors. They kind of saturate your image without making it look unrealistic. Anytime I'm shooting landscapes, whether that's video or photo, I'll make sure to throw a polarizer on and really just get some of those awesome shots. So now that we got all of that out of the way, let's talk about shutter priority. If I were me, I would choose shutter priority if I knew I had to keep the same shutter speed, but I didn't wanna compromise on the aperture and I didn't wanna be fiddling around with the exposure settings while I'm out in the field. For example, if I'm shooting a sports game or an insect flying and I knew I wanted the higher shutter speed to get some of those freeze frame type shots, then I would just set my shutter to say maybe one over 1250 and just set it to shutter priority. Then the aperture and the ISO would automatically adjust to whatever I had my exposure compensation set to. In most cases, I have the exposure compensation set to 0.0, .0 so the aperture would just fluctuate up and down, maintaining that 0.0. .0. So we talked about shutter priority. Well, what's aperture priority? Well, it's the same thing, it's just an aperture. If we're shooting a portrait and we wanna make sure that we wanna maintain that nice blurry background, then I would just set my aperture to say like f2.8, 
and then I would just turn on aperture priority and let the shutter speed go up and down because I wouldn't be too worried that the portrait is gonna move around too much. Most portraits, they're standing still. If my portrait was walking, then I would just go to manual, I would turn my aperture down to f2.8 and maybe turn the shutter speed up to like one over 400 and then I would throw an ND filter on if the image is still overexposed. Wedding photographers and videographers use these settings because it's one less thing they have to worry about and they also know what they wanna maintain. Once you set either aperture or shutter priority, you would just wanna throw your ISO on auto so the camera has more options to expose from. If you think you could benefit from a one-on-one -on -one online personal training or mentorship with all things film, click on the link in the description and you can schedule an appointment with me to help you reach your goals. I'm sorry if we didn't take a deep enough dive into the sea of exposure, but at least you'll have a good head start so the next time you're out in the field, you'll be able to switch it over to manual exposure and you will be in complete control of your camera. I'm Joe with Film Alliance. Thanks for watching and until the next video, peace.